a little hectic around here today. Hey, welcome to Strictly Business, right? That's right. That's where we are today. Strictly Business. How are you today, Mike? Uh, a little rushed, a little, a little busy. A little crazy? Right. Hey, it's, it's close to summer. Right, that's why. We've lost our students behind the scenes, and now I've got Pat doing a job that he's trained 10 minutes for. So, he'll be <laughs> fine. He's easy to train. Yeah. He's a quick learner. He, I hope so. <laughs> if not, I'm going to disappear. Okay. Well, that's all right. <laughs> all right. So, uh, what are we doing today? Well, today we have invited uh, one of our newest employees at the OSU South Centers, mm -hmm. a fine young lady by the name of Hannah Scott. Okay. Hannah is the director of our Cooperative Development Center at the OSU South Centers. Okay. What's a cooperative development center do? Wow. I guess they work you cooperatively know? and they're a center and they work cooperatively, right? Cool. Work with others. Sounds like maybe. a friendly place to be. Must be. Must <laughs> be. Well, I'm not the one to answer that question. That's why we brought Hannah along today to, okay. to give a professional answer for that question. All right. Maybe a little more educated than what I am. Okay. All right. <laughs> Since you're a, a new employee, mm -hmm. uh, where do you, what's your background? Where do you come from? And Sure. Um, I am originally from Brown County, Ohio, so a little bit west of here uh, by a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up there uh, on a farm, so my family and I farm beef cattle, grain, and tobacco. Um, my educational background, I attended Duke University for my undergraduate degree, and then I went to The Ohio State University to get my master's degree. Um, I'm still currently finishing that and I study rural sociology. Okay, so rural sociology is what you're getting your master's in? Yes. What was your bachelor's? Sociology. Okay. So, and it's a great fit there. Alright, so now what do you, what are you doing with it in this position? That's a great question. So the Ohio Cooperative Development Center that's at the OSU South Centers is really focused on rural development. That's a huge part of our mission. The reason that we work with co-ops, um, specifically in rural Ohio and West Virginia, we cover those two states, um, the reason that we work with them is to help those regions develop economically. So my background in rural sociology has really helped me to understand um, what are what is the situation in rural America, aside from having lived it, what academically, how can it be understood, um, and, and what's being done to help rural areas uh, and what works and what doesn't from kind of a more uh, structured perspective than just having lived in a rural area. So, so in general, what do you understand about a rural area? That's a huge what's, question. What's their challenges or what, what is it that you're having to deal with and, you know. Uh, and what are some of the strong points maybe too? Yeah. You know, bo both good and, you know. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Both things that are, that are helping out. Yeah, so. Um, I think one of the largest things is that rural areas often experience a gap uh, compared to their urban counterparts. So those gaps could be, um, there are a few areas that stand out for rural areas. Often there are gaps in um, healthcare availability, housing availability. Um, there's actually also gaps in terms of um, food access. Now what's um, a gap? Is so that distance or is that money? It could be both. Uh, it could be uh, lack of access, not as many resources. So like I have to, to travel 30 miles to get to the doctor, that type sort of thing, right. or if more? Right, you have to travel 30 miles to get to the doctor compared to an, somebody who's living in an urban area might have four or five doctors within a 30 mile radius, mm -hmm. or um, you know, they might have five grocery stores where you have to travel 12 miles to the grocery store and your produce is a bit more expensive because it has traveled so far. Mm -hmm. So um, those gaps, both economically and distance-wise, um, mm -hmm. exist in a lot of different areas. Like I was saying, healthcare, um, food access, housing, um, rural infrastructure, places like that. Um, so my background in rural sociology has really helped me to understand those gaps. Really, what do those, where do they exist? Mm -hmm. um, what do they mean? For rural America and what are people doing to to kind of work towards um, helping develop them yeah mm -hmm. and sort of connected to that uh, I'm a British biker okay I ride triumphs so I'm on a lot of the internet boards where I'm talking to people from England or whatever and whenever the the uh, gas went up uh, 
they were going all boo-hoo, so what? It's way high over here. I said, there's a difference. Over here, you know, you, uh, a poor person lives out in the sticks, one, because they can't afford the place in the city, mm -hmm. and then they, uh, they don't have probably a really uh, fuel-efficient car. Right. And they, ha they may have to travel 30 to 40 miles to work. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, a gas price hike really affects our culture more than it does theirs, where they have the option to uh, get on public transit mm -hmm. and they live in the same town. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, why don't they just move to where the jobs are? It's like, well, you know, maybe this family farm or plot has been in the family forever. Uh, plus the price you would get out of that versus the price you would get out of a city house. You're not going to get, you know, you can't buy the same right. thing. Mm -hmm. Plus, they really value their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. These country people don't want to live in the city. I like having my land and the deer and everything else out there. That's right. So it's a, a different mindset. So that's yeah. uh, the reason I told the story is I think it fits what, with what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. It's definitely a. Um, there are cultural reasons, social reasons, economic reasons. Um, all of those tie in, and so when you think about helping these areas, um, you have to kind of think about all of those, um, and not not neglect one or the other, but kind of uh, understand them all. So my background there has really helped me with that. Okay. Right. So with cooperatives. Uh, are you saying that you're getting people together to help each other out? Absolutely. That's uh, like what? what the definition of cooperation is right. working together to do something. Um, so in cooperatives, usually there is um, a mutual need between a group. So we encourage really that, that these groups find that mutual need and that they're agreed upon what that need is and kind of the ways that they... Um, what would a need be? That could be something like um, needing a market for a product or lacking a service that you mutually need, for instance, electricity mm -hmm. or um, marketing your grain or livestock uh, or uh, wanting to, to invest in renewable energy like a solar array. Um, those kind of mutual needs, if you can do something better together as a group than you can as an individual, then the cooperative model is something that you should look into. Uh, and a, a cooperative is, is a business model, just like a C corporation or an LLC is a business model. But there are some really unique aspects to the cooperative business model that encourage that working together. Um, and it's really based on a couple of principles. First, that cooperatives are member owned. So the members that come together to start this business are the owners of the business, very similar to investors in a corporation are and members. you have voting rights and everything you have voting rights but what's different in co-ops is that um, most if not all co-ops um, go by the principle of one member one vote so regardless of your ownership in that cooperative let's say that you and brad invest in a cooperative you become members of a co-op to sell your fruits and vegetables okay say. Um, if you are of a specific membership structure and you invest your membership fee of $700 and Brad invests a membership fee, let's say his farm's a little bit smaller, he doesn't have as many resources, he won't be selling as much product. Cool, um, I'm the big wheel. Yeah, yeah you're the big right. guy. You're in charge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brad might pay a membership fee of $250, but you still each get one vote. Mm -hmm. You okay. won't get more votes than Brad gets. And that's a lot different than than other business models right. like an investor oriented firm. Right. So, so it's based on the number of shares in other firms, but this is right. just by member. Right, one so, member, one okay. vote is a huge principle in co-op businesses. Uh, and sometimes you get a little bit of pushback there. So what's, you know, what's your kind of push to, to invest in this co-op? You're mm -hmm. putting in $700 and Brad's putting in 200. Why would you do that? The other principle of co-ops is, um, equitable member benefit, which doesn't necessarily mean equal among you two. It means that it's mm -hmm. fair. Okay. So if you use the co-op, often co-ops have what they call a patronage system. So the more you use the co-op as a member owner, 
uh, the more portion of that net income you'll receive at the end of the year. Because as, a, as an sure. owner, you are entitled to uh, the returns. On now, that. is that only okay. for what I'm selling? Yeah, well, it depends on the co-op. Um, I have a colleague that likes to say, if you've seen one co-op, you've seen one co-op. Um, right. <laughs> they're all very different. Yeah, um, one we have in this county, which everybody knows about, is the Buckeye Rural Electric. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Which I think they buy their electric, and then they own the distribution and mm -hmm. servicing mm -hmm. stuff. And then everybody, I guess, that's on Buckeye Rural has somewhat of a say in that. Right. Yeah, they would have a vote uh, in that co-op. Uh, rural electrics are really interesting. That's an example of a co-op that would have been developed for a lack of service. So uh, rural electrics were developed really because other power and energy companies weren't investing in or putting infrastructure in rural areas. Right, and just like cable systems. Why am I gonna run five miles of cable down the road to get five customers or two customers. Right, doesn't so, make economic sense. Right, Correct. so we're not gonna do that. Right. But if you and your neighbors come together, it makes more economic sense. If mm -hmm. you're willing to do it together and invest in that together, um, then there's there's the sense for a co-op and that's why it, it doesn't make sense in every situation. Mm -hmm. It's not a business model that you should use regardless of the situation. Um, but it makes sense in some. Right. So mm -hmm. more people working together have a bigger voice mm -hmm. and have more bargaining power. Oh, absolutely. And maybe that's kind of the whole underlying reason why cooperatives were formed. Yeah, it can be. Um, so that, that ability to come together to m you guys marketing your fruits and vegetables together have more power than you marketing them individually. Right. Uh, it's the same if you want to purchase. Mm -hmm. So co-ops can be for... Um, there are a couple different categories that like academics like to break them down into. So one of those is purchasing. So if you go in together for a shared purchasing project. Um, we can get the group by. Right, right. you the can truck. get a wholesale price <coughs> rather than a retail price. Um, marketing is another one. So as I was saying in that example mm -hmm. before, putting your products together in a bigger pool gives you more marketing power. Um, okay. Service co-ops, those are another kind of classification. Um, and I think that's, that's, those are the, the main ones. Those are the main ones. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, uh, I kind of learn, I mean, I, I know we've talked a lot about the definitions and stuff, but, you know, kind of the way I understand companies like that or how, how they might function is to kind of put a, like a, a face or a name with the definitions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe talk about some examples of some different co-ops that maybe all of our viewers would be familiar with. Absolutely. Maybe they don't even know their co-ops. Yeah, and that is a problem actually, not a problem, but that's something I come across quite often is that um, people don't know that a co-op is a co-op. Um, mm -hmm. So there are some really familiar ones that uh, viewers might be familiar with. Uh, for instance, Ace Hardware, that's a cooperatively owned business. Okay. Um, Welch's, the people that make grape juice. So okay. that's cooperatively owned. Um, is that like from the farmers that... So. Do you're hitting on another great point. A co-op can be organized from many sides. So you could organize it um, as farmers, as a group of consumers, um, as a group of companies coming together. Um, but a lot of those companies that you see that say farmer owned, for instance, mm -hmm. like Welch's would say farmer owned, they are a farmer co-op. Um, okay. So that's how they're organized. Land Lakes, that's a brand that quite mm. a few people recognize as cooperatively owned. And then my favorite one is actually the Green Bay Packers. They mm. are a cooperative. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're owned by their community members in Wisconsin, so. Uh, did you know that? No. I did not know that either. They've been That's a co-op since uh, about the 20s, 1920s. Wow. Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> is that to build a stadium and stuff like that, or? Part of it was, I, I think, uh, part of it was financial concerns, and mm -hmm. the community wanted to keep this um, institution in their community. Uh, yeah. So they kind of maybe as a business, it wasn't making sense at the time, but we right. feel passionate enough to keep it around. We're going to invest mm -hmm. in it mm -hmm. and take part ownership. Right. And that's another great way to organize a co-op is is for um, not necessarily economic reasons, but for uh, social reasons. So perhaps there's um, a community landmark, for instance, a building in your community that is in disrepair, but it, it historically is really important to your community and you want to save it. 
probably so, one of those things sort of like a theater maybe a theater yep. or um i can think of some examples Train like a station. restaurant restaurants yep. um, those are those reasons for forming a co-op are usually pretty um i was just thinking sad. about the what is it called the that market in in columbus would that be the North Market? North Market, right. Um, I don't believe that's cooperatively owned, but I could definitely see how it could be. Right. Farmers mm -hmm. Markets are another example. Um, the Ohio Cooperative Development Center for the past few years has worked with quite a few farmers markets, actually, and the co-op structure works really well for them mm -hmm. um, because it, you could come together as a group of farmers and your mutual need is a place to market your product. Yeah. Um, and you receive then that benefit, a member benefit of a place to market your product. Um, so the other big thing in co-ops is, I mentioned member owned, they're member controlled, we talked about that one member, one vote principle, but that they have some kind of member benefit. Um, and that's not Sam's Club and Costco. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> You're a member for a whole different reason, I suppose. Yeah. Yes. Typically there's a, a bit bigger of a mutual need there between right. members. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. Interesting. So it does seem that a lot of these cooperatives are formed more, you know, a lot of the examples are rural mm -hmm. type of applications, farmers, mm -hmm. groups that are in, you know, more of a dispersed area. So maybe, you know, the cooperative model is something that really does fit the rural areas better than it does an urban area. Yeah, I think that there are, obviously, I think that there are benefits in all mm -hmm. areas. <laughs> right. I'm kind of biased. I've, I've heard of a lot of cooperatives, yeah. you know, and the food area in, right. in cities. Yeah, they're, and they work well in cities. local markets. Right. Um, but there are, they are really beneficial for rural areas because then you have that, that power from coming together as a group. Mm -hmm. uh, where in rural areas that can be really important. Um, I'm glad you mentioned food co-ops because that's a really kind of, hot area for co-ops right now. We get mm -hmm. a lot of interest from food groups. Um, in cities, are you saying? Everywhere. Or? We yeah. get a lot of interest everywhere. Um, I know there's some people, there's some in my neighborhood, there's some in this Rye Grand area that want to do like a group, uh, not farm, but uh, a garden. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, like community garden, which everybody will take food from and help yeah. weed and all that sort of thing. That sounds great. If you guys are interested in uh, developing a co-op, give us a call. We can help. Mm -hmm. um, we What we do is provide service to new and emerging cooperatives. So we help those groups that are interested in forming a co-op, as well as co-ops that have already formed that are fairly new looking to grow uh, mm -hmm. and expand. Uh, and so what we do with them ranges client to client. We provide direct one-on-one -on -one services that are really tailored to the client, but for instance, we could help with anything from um, business planning. We can provide assistance with that, which is really great because we're also a part of the business development network at the OSU South Centers, which includes, I'm sure you've talked about it here on the show, uh, which includes a couple of different centers with business specialists. Um, so we can work hand in hand with them to help with that. Um, so business planning, um, bylaw development for the co-op, board training, membership education, all of those kinds of things. We really run the gamut uh, in terms of how we can help a co-op. But I would say probably the most popular, uh, what people seek us out for the most is probably formation counseling. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have this idea. Do you think it will work? And how do I go about from taking it from an idea to an actual business? How do I get it legally formed? And uh, what are the processes I have to go through for that? Now, is there like a corporation or something that would be uh, part of the co-op? Or, I mean, as far as the the setup of it, you know, the LLC or mm -hmm. whatever, how would the, is there a special place for a co-op? There is. Actually, co-ops are a special um, subchapter T corporation. Mm -hmm. So that's how they're organized uh, in Ohio. If you go to file a business, just like you're filing an LLC or a C corporation or an S corp, in Ohio, you would just on that form, check the box that says that you're a cooperative. Um, those statutes differ in every state. So for instance, we cover Ohio and West Virginia as our service area, and the laws that govern co-ops in Ohio are different than the laws that govern co-ops in West Virginia. So uh, <laughs> so you can help folks through that process? Yes. Okay, yes. that's good. We can help them with what are those differences and how, 
Do you have any co-ops that go over the river? I mean, not are solely over there, but between oh, yeah. West Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky. Um, so our service is Ohio and West Virginia, and <coughs> we have we have groups that you know they can be organized in West Virginia and do business in Ohio or flip flop or. Um, okay. That's not uncommon. Mm -hmm. Right. So can you have a combined co-op where you can have members across different states? Like members from Ohio and members from West Virginia can form together? Yeah, so if you okay. think about those larger co-ops that I was talking about, they have members from all over the place. Um, okay. But that co-op will have to follow the statutes where it is um, legally located, registered, legally hmm. registered and located. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's, okay. a, that's an interesting twist to co-ops yeah. is that it, it can be different state by state. Mm -hmm. Okay. There was a question, are there uh, any costs legal at starting a co-op? Um, well, those costs would be similar to the cost for starting any other business. Mm -hmm. So the cost for filing uh, with the state filing your business, there's a cost there, a filing fee. Mm -hmm. um, Is that much? I believe right now for cooperatives it's around one hundred and twenty-five dollars. Oh. So, that's so it's the really, same as that's really prohibitive. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> and then there there can be other costs. For instance, if you um, seek the fee, the the services of an attorney mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. look over your articles of incorporation and your bylaws, um, there's a cost there, right. obviously, as well as any other professional services right. that you might use, like an accountant. And so then there are grants associated with co-ops or not? There can be, depending on what the co-op does. So um, there is a segment of USDA rural development um, that is kind of a cooperative service segment. So they have specific programming for co-ops. That's the first one that comes to mind that might have some resources that are specific to co-ops. And then otherwise, um, in Ohio, a co-op is a business just like any other, so. You're on your own. There are those resources <laughs> for, for businesses, mm -hmm. you know, depending right. on what the business does. Right. Um, and in terms of, of other resources that might be specific to co-ops, um, I know that one of, the, one of the questions we've been getting recently is, is about startup capital. How do you finance this to start? Um, and there are some, some institutions that are focused on co-ops. There are some banks that are mm -hmm. focused specifically on okay. co-ops because those financial concerns can be a lot different right. going from one owner to multiple owners, owners or right. 12 owners. Yeah, and, and so whenever you go, you know, one owner, then you, you talk about a whole set of problems with just one decision maker. Then you go with 50, and, and you mentioned earlier the legal you know, maybe getting an attorney involved in writing those articles of incorporation. That's probably a very wise thing to do when you have many people who are owners Absolutely. involved. Absolutely. One of the so. biggest things in co-ops is making sure that your members are all on the same page. Right. Um, really good or communication. Or it's like herding cats. Like yeah. Yeah. Say. It's <laughs> basically, it, it's taking the complexity of one business and putting group communication in there. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's fun. So have you done one yet? I know you've not been working there for very long. <laughs> yeah, I just actually started at the end of January, but um, yeah, I have been working with, with clients and uh, helping them out with whatever their needs are. So right. Right. whether that's bylaw development or just kind of talking through the idea, would that work in a cooperative model, mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of things like that. Okay. And, and so again, the services you know, you're providing here in <laughs> Appalachian, Ohio, in these rural communities, do they cost if I want if, if Mike and I want to go ahead and start our produce co-op I mean can you help us does it cost us anything to have you help us work on that um, the short answer is no okay um, we actually the Ohio Cooperative Development Center is funded through the USDA rural development so we're funded through what's called a rural cooperative development grant program and have okay. been for um, this is the 15th year I think um, you might correct me if I'm wrong on that I, I think, think that's is. about right yeah, yeah. Um, and so to those, those clients that fall into that eligibility for that program, our services are free. Okay. So, um, Good. Yeah. So that can complement our Small Business Development Center. Absolutely. Yeah. There is a lot of overlap. And it's great being located at the OSU South Centers because there are um, technical experts in a lot of areas from horticulture to mm -hmm. uh, soil and water resources and uh, direct marketing. 
aquaculture, things like that. So on the technical assistance side, you know, our business development network is, is good at the business side. And on the technical assistance side, we, can, we have contacts and resource links that can help us with that as well. So. Do you have yeah. any cooperatives in the incubator? I don't believe we have any housed in the incubator. Okay. I might have to work on that. Yeah. <laughs> we have some spaces. We could, we could okay. rent a space in there. All right. We could sell our produce out of there. Yeah. Let's got to find yeah. some produce. <laughs> we, I know some Amish. We can buy some. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a, <laughs> I'm not sure what that, there is a, uh, a thing that, it's the mile from my house. Uh, they've set up a place where they, they sell Amish goods, but mm -hmm. in bulk. Right, mm -hmm. and I think a whole bunch of them come together and right. mm -hmm. do that. I'm not sure if that fits in that model or. Yeah, so uh, one of the other <laughs> things is that we work with groups that are legally formed as a co-op, the you know the legal business structure. But you know you can be another business structure like a nonprofit right. and mm -hmm. be cooperative like. Right. So uh, groups coming together to work in a cooperative like manner. Mm -hmm. um, right. We can help them as well. Right. Well, I know in the past, you know, at the, at the South Centers with the Cooperative Development Center before before you worked there, um, we had some different cooperative groups that had formed for a specific need. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them was a group of manufacturing companies that kind of joined together and uh, started out and had a need of employee training. Hmm. So they all joined together, formed a cooperative, and they were able to go out and buy training services for their employees. You know, maybe some specialized training. Maybe they so, only had one co one person within that company that needed that technical training, but by forming all those companies together, okay, now we have one individual each within 12 companies. So now we've got a group of 12. Mm -hmm. So instead of company A sending that person across the United States for a week for training, and so every $2, company $2, doing dollars. that, well, yeah. So now we can bring the trainer there and have that training done locally, mm -hmm. which saves every one of those companies money. Mm -hmm. Right. Cut the cost in less than half. And that's sure. another great, so. uh, one of those areas of mutual benefit, cost avoidance mm -hmm. um, can be one of the um, kind of incentives for forming a cooperative yeah. uh, financial incentive. But like I said, those, ca those mutual benefits or mutual needs could be financial, social, political, right. whatever. Do you have a lot of uh, online material? If if somebody was not ready to approach you to look into it, mm -hmm. do you have online material that they go over to, to flush it out a little bit before they actually ask for help? Absolutely. So uh, we have a website, the Ohio Cooperative Development Center's website is nested under the OSU South Center's website. Uh, so if you go on there, uh, OSU South Center's southcenters.osu.edu slash cooperatives. Okay. Um, there are quite a few resources on there, and one of the probably most useful ones from my perspective is what we call a formation kit. So okay. uh, it's a kit that's downloadable. It has quite a few forms and instructions and templates for th people that are thinking about forming a cooperative, and it kind of takes you through the steps of cooperative formation. Uh, it's a great way to kind of get your mind around uh, what those what steps it, what it's, are. And, and that's always nice to, to see a form that asks all the questions like, oh, okay, this is how I need to get my ducks in a row. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. And what ducks I need. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so for Maybe my ducks aren't big enough. Right. I <laughs> Maybe I don't have a pond. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we just forget about it. Right. <laughs> for instance, in there we have a, a, a bylaw, set of bylaw questions. So if I tell a group, well, you know, legally you, you need a set of bylaws, then mm -hmm that there's a set of questions in there that if you answer all of them, your bylaws are, are almost complete. Hmm. So that's good. That's yeah, really useful. If people, you know, aren't ready to kind of seek out direct services, that's a great resource. Cool. Great. Sound like a, a, a good thing to know in, in these parts. Yes, in these parts. It's a great program. Yeah. It's a great program. Okay. So. Well, thanks for uh, coming on the show. Thank uh, you for having yep. me. Thank you do very we much. know who's on next month? Uh, we do not yet. Okay. Uh, next up, I think we have uh, uh, David Lawrence, the dean, uh, with Dr. Stephanie. Right, with Dr. Stephanie Alexander talking about student services or uh, not student services, the Learning Center and student success. Yes. That's it. So that will be on in. 30 minutes, so stay tuned, and thanks for watching Strictly Business.